talk <clears throat> if we're going to talk about biodiversity and evolution as the mechanism shaping all of that in the context of organismal biology I can think of no better place to go to start than the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. Now I want to go there in four short time periods to set the stage for what I want to talk about in the rest of this lecture. The first time I'd like to take you there is in the mid 1800s and I want to imagine that you show up on the Galapagos Islands and you look around you and the first thing that you'll notice is that all of the islands are volcanic and looking at the fauna that is there and the flora you see that they've presumably never been connected to the mainland they've always been separated from the mainland Ecuador by 800 kilometers or so so you look around yourself and you think oh I'm a naturalist I'm gonna go and collect biodiversity here and bring it back and sell it when I get back to uh, England for example and I want to uh, understand where this came from and write a narrative about it. So you're Charles Darwin, of course. You show up, you start collecting animals and plants from around the Galapagos. And to your great surprise, you find that on the different islands, you have different species, which seems weird. But then also, any given species seems to differ dramatically among the different islands. The mockingbirds have different beak shapes on different islands. The little finches hopping around have different beak shapes and sizes on the different islands. And most strikingly, perhaps, the tortoises. The tortoises look really different between islands. Sometimes the tortoises have a saddle-shaped shell or uh, carapace. Other times it's dome-shaped. And some islands seem to have the dome-shaped ones, and other islands seem to have the saddle-shaped ones. And you were looking at this and thinking, now, why would God, in all of his infinite wisdom, seek to put a specific, different type of tortoise on each island? And this would start you thinking that perhaps there's something else at work here. And of course, you know, if you're Charles Darwin, you go home and use this partly as inspiration for developing the theory of natural selection. Now let's fast forward to the 1900s. And you go to the Galapagos again, and now, of course, we understand that uh, natural selection is an important force that has structured the origin of all life on Earth. And you look around you again at all of these different organisms. And you see the tortoises look a different shape in their shell there than over there. The finches over there look different from the ones over there. And the collection of finches at any one given location have a bunch of different beak sizes. And then you start to think, okay, if natural selection shaped this variation, then perhaps I can look at what these organisms are doing and find out why natural selection would have made a different shaped tortoise shell there from over there. Or why the different finches at a given place and in different places have such different beaks. So you watch them and you see that, well, look, well, the tortoises that have dome shaped uh, carapaces, they tend to live on low scrubby vegetation islands. And the ones with saddles, they tend to live on islands where the vegetation is more high. And then you notice that the ones on, with the saddles on the islands where the vegetation is high are reaching up their necks and uh, grabbing at vegetation high on Opuntia cactuses, for example. Whereas the ones on, on, uh, with domed shells on smaller, lower, scrubbier vegetation islands they seem to be plowing their way through the vegetation. You think, well, that makes sense to have a dome shell if you've got low vegetation, but if you have to reach high, it's better to have this saddle shell so you can raise your neck higher. Then you look at the finches and you say, oh, look, the, the big-beaked one is feeding on large seeds, and the small-beaked one is feeding on small seeds. And then you think, and the one that looks like a woodpecker's beak is acting like a woodpecker, the one that has a little tweezer-like beak like a warbler, well, it behaves like a warbler. It's picking insects off of the bark. And so you say, well, this makes sense. This is natural selection fitting organisms to their different environments, and that's how the diversity of life came to be on the Galapagos. Now let's fast forward again to the 1970s, when a couple of McGill professors, Peter and Rosemary Grant, thought, let's go uh, with our postdoc 
and let's start studying the dynamics of these finches on the islands. And they go to a very small island called Daphne Major. And they and their students set up shop there and capture all the birds. And then they try to um, mark them all, find out who's mating with who. And then they wait to see what happens. And it just so happens that as one of the students, uh, Peter Bogue, decided to set up and start working on these islands, it was a very uh, dry year. And there was no reproduction of the plants. As a result, there was no reproduction of the finches. Instead, a whole bunch of finches died. They, since they'd known the beak sizes of all the finches before the drought, they could see who lived and who died. And they say, oh, it's the big beaked ones that tended to live. And the big beaked ones are living because they can crack the larger seeds that are all that's left after the finches deplete the softer and smaller seeds from the environment. So the larger beak birds are surviving, and we know by looking at the offspring and parents and offspring that beak size is highly inherited. So then the rains come back and you see it again and you see, oh look, the new generation of finches that's produced, they have a larger average beak size than the ones from before. And you've witnessed natural selection not just as a process that has shaped the diversity of life over many years, but rather you saw it happen. Now the final time period I want to take you to Galapagos is when I started going, and that was in about 2002. And we wanted to study this variation as well. Now, we have worked on it in many aspects, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at these dynamics as they occurred and link these two processes that is natural selection and the diversification of the different finches. And the way we did that was studying one species where you have two different beak sizes within the same species, large and small. And we found by measuring the finches over many years and figuring out who lived and who died in the classical way that Peter and Rosemary Grant did, we found that selection was pushing these two forms apart. That is, the beak sizes in the middle weren't surviving very well but the larger and smaller beak sizes were. So natural selection seemed to be right before our eyes, taking this one species and causing it to split apart along that same axis of variation that shaped the adaptive radiation of finches as a whole. And with new genomic methods, we and other people can find the specific genes that are driving the evolution of that beak size. Now I wanted to ground our discussion of evolution, but also other things that will occur in the course, in particular places, in this case the Galapagos. We'll return to the Galapagos for other lectures. We will also introduce you to other places in which we can ground the concepts that we're presenting to you. And now that I've given you this introduction about Galapagos and told you a bit about Galapagos, let's step back and look at the bigger picture and talk to you more about the way evolution works.